I was looking for work in the steel mills and there didn't seem to be anything open and somebody suggested I, I, I look into uh, possibly getting a job with the, with the federal government. I came out to uh, <laughs> Johnsville. Where in the world is that? <laughs> I ended up out here and, uh, as a uh, biophysicist. Oh, really? When I came aboard, I had no idea what, what they had here. And as I got here in 1950, the centrifuge was just starting, and they were starting to uh, to run it, and they they needed uh, cams mm. to control it. And right, up in the blister. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were going to hire out to have those made, and I said, I think I could make those cams. You can make them. I said, I think so. <laughs> so I, I began to make cams. I designed the cam table, and I was putting out cams every week. And they were making them down in our, our machine shop. And as I kept doing this, I, I, my cams got to be so complicated that I finally decided, that, why don't I put a computer in, it, in this control? So uh, in the meantime, I, I, I got a little 10 amplifier computer that I hired over, wired over to the, where the cam table was, and I was able to operate the uh, centrifuge for the first time with, with a computer. And what year was that? That was uh, probably in 1952. In the meantime, they began to put me more in charge of the operation of the whole thing, and then they came down to upgrading the, uh, the, the, the centrifuge, and they put me in charge of it. So I laid out all the things that I felt ne needed in terms of the control system change, the one that moved it from the blister down to a place on the, on the platform. And we needed changes in the powerhouse, they needed changes in the arm itself. And uh, so I, I laid out a whole schedule of things that they, they needed and uh, they, uh, they began to, to follow in what I'd asked for. And finally, when they came to this computer, they were gonna give me this, uh, another little 10 amplifier units. And I said, uh, that isn't what I ordered, I ordered this. No, but they said that you can give me that. It's cheaper and you do the same thing. And I said, cancel the order. <laughs> so I went down to the company that I had hired to uh, upgrade the uh, control system. And I said, you put this computer in your control system. So we used that, that computer throughout uh, for the next 20, 25 years. I, I can't tell you. It was a beautiful computer and we could do everything with it and, and, and as we got that involved then we began to, to get moving. When when the centrifuge was originally run off the cams, yeah. help me understand what those are. Are they almost like a record? Right, right. They, they were big circle things and, and in it they had indentations. Okay. One of them, and there were three of them stacked on top of the other. Yeah, one, 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 one controlled the speed of the arm, another one controlled the position of the outer gimbal, another one controlled the position of the inner gimbal. Okay. And I, I had been designing these things, uh, and it took some mathematics to do that, by the way. I, I had this cam table, and that was a thing like this, and I, and I, I could, I, I knew the center of the cam, and out here I, I knew the, the radius and of the arm as it turned around. So I had to determine, based upon the circular of the follower, I had to design the contour of the cam to take that into account, so that all three cams operated t t together. Can I think of it this way, that the, the curves of the cam were, were like the graphs of your equations? Right. Now, I had one for each equation, if you will, yeah, or if, that one, one for each what, dimension. What you had, had to do is that depending upon, well, for example, with the speed of the arm, uh, the, the, the cam arm, or the arm, the more it would go out, the faster the, the arm would turn. You had to know the, the, the RPM, if you will, mm -hmm. of the arm. And again, you had to know the, the position that the gimbals had to be at that part of, of the of the turn, mm -hmm. the the primary purpose that we did in those days was to keep the vector 
aligned with the the, the subject. Okay. As he so that if, if as he sped up, he would roll over, and he would pitch forward to take into account the the angular acceleration of the arm, and then it would come back. And that if you slowed down, then you would go back like that. And if you did this, if it all worked correctly, he would have the smoothest ride. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. The original arm, which was which was was a oblate spheroid, right. eight foot in, in diameter and about six foot wide. Right. Uh, so that had to be taken into account. From the time they described the profile to you, they'd uh -huh. give you the G profile, and you had to con convert that into your equations, right? And then design the cam, and then that had to go to the machine shop. Yeah. For one of it, what did they make the cams out of? It, it, they were sort of uh, plastic. I won't say plastic. They were, they about, were about half inch. Yeah, they they could they could be. You put them at the machine shop. They could uh, take their thing and, and 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 sort of roll it around in there and, and cut in where I, where I had. I I gave them a, a like complete, a template. Uh huh. You give them a template. A template. Right. Yeah. Okay. Actually, in the first place, it was probably a paper t template, mm -hmm. and then they, they they would make a mark on on the cam surface itself, and mm -hmm. then cut the, the surface. So we, we did a very good job on that. I was it's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. I, I, every every week that they come up with a whole new set of, of profiles that they wanted me to design. This became a full time job. Oh my gosh. Making those cams. When they designed the centrifuge. Was there a particular reason why they did, they had the original gondola? Was that oblate spheroid? Was there something about the characteristics of that? Um, you know, I'm just curious about why does it look like a silver M and M versus you know years later when you upgraded the system, it was the round ball. That's well, still they there. they thought about what how much space they needed inside for primarily one subject. Okay. okay. And. Uh, it, it didn't need to be very wide when they first thought about it. It was just going to be for a, a subject to sit in there and un undergo G. When I went to uh, NADC, I was in the thermal research area to begin with, but we hadn't yet set up a uh, laboratory at NADC. I really had nothing to do. So Dr. Beckman, who was the author of the um, experimental data, he was head of physiology at that time. Uh, he told me he had this big bin full of acceleration data, and I thought, it's acceleration lab, I should do something about that. And I asked, would it be all right if I looked at that data and made an analysis and whatever? And he said, oh, that'd be great. So that's what I did. And uh, although the article uh, was published in, uh, I think he published it originally, uh, his analysis of the data in uh, aviation medicine a couple of years before, I took a different view of it and uh, came up with the, the article there. And um, it was just a reanalysis, a different way of looking at the same data. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess maybe it was simpler than what he had. I don't know, but anyway, it came out to be very useful. And that's about it. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> One of the first people I worked with coming back from uh, college and was Flanagan Gray and I, I think what was interesting is that I remember standing at the centrifuge chamber the big door was open and Flanagan was there and he drew for me on a piece of paper on the door this concept of the Iron Maiden oh my god <laughs> and uh, every year I came back uh, for work for summer job and the uh, <coughs> project had progressed a little bit more and more until finally the Iron Maiden was finished and we had it on the centrifuge. And Flanagan was quite a character and he had a breathing mechanism 
that you know would displace the water as he would breathe and mm -hmm. everything. Well, we got him on the centrifuge, <clears throat> and we we're going to make his historical run, and the breathing uh, mechanism failed. So uh, Flangen said, just fill it up with water and screw the faceplate on. I'll hold my breath. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we went to, what, 38G or something like that yeah. while he was holding his breath. Wow. How long were you at uh, NADC? Oh, 53, and I retired in 80. What's that, 27 years? What would you say is um, your... Most vivid memory, because you've had a lot of great stories, but your most vivid memory and um, maybe what would you say looking back? You've done so much. What is? Uh, what would you say you're, you know, if someone was going to say, <clears throat> not your friend to brag about you, but if you were going to say, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> one, one, one of the best things was, you know, um, I wanted to ride that centrifuge. And, uh, of course, women all know the breasts are going to get squashed. <laughs> That's the first thing they worry about. They know how to and, then, and, then, and, your, and your heart, your heart's not going to take it, and so on. So there happens to be a federal law that says you can't subject anybody to any experiment that you wouldn't subject yourself to. So I says, there's a law. I'm not doing this with human subjects here, so I want to ride the centrifuge. And the law says that I can't subject anybody, blah, 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 blah. So, hey, what could they do? They let me ride the centrifuge, and I rode that to gray out. That was about seven and a half oh my. G, mm -hmm. same as a man, and uh, the heart rate, everything was just fine. <laughs> so after that, they took all the secretaries and everybody, and they had a whole study of women on the centrifuge. Oh my, that's so that, funny. So that was really fun. And you know, when the, when the uh, end of the run is coming, at the the globe, the gondola uh, turns, and uh, it feels like you're doing a jackknife over the side of that. Mm -hmm. It's great. <laughs> so that, that I remember. And that, that's kind of one of the attractions for the centrifuges too. Is you know I tried to get the test pilot school. Um, I ended up taking the short courses down at PAX. Um, over the years, when I was still a minister, but to actually, you know, go out and do the 24 flights and do the the 11 months curriculum, that that's pretty neat stuff. Um, ended up doing a lot of that kind of stuff anyhow, but the centrifuge was a way of actually doing that. Yeah. And you know, and, and again, there's there's a certain satisfaction. Of being, of being like one of a handful of people that, that did stuff that kind of furthered scientific knowledge. And I mean, we, we developed stuff that actually is out of fleet in there. Yeah, Harold. Uh, <laughs> Harold's last experiment was uh, what they called the tiger crouch. The G, uh, we're exposing subjects to positive G but they were to crouch in their seat. I don't know. Harold had this uh, classic German uh, way that he held his cigarettes at the time you could smoke on the flight deck. <clears throat> and, and Harold would sit there and view it. And he would uh, say to the subject at the time, he said, Do you think you can take another G? <laughs> <laughs> To which the subject responded, I'll try to keep it clean. JJ, get me the out of here. The culture of the base was highly technically competent and to a great degree highly disciplined, highly focused, national leaders in different areas. So when the NADC spoke, people listened. Mm -hmm. okay. On top of that we had the space program. The other aspect of the culture is we had several generations of the same family that worked at one base. We had people whose grandfather worked at the base 
whose father worked in the base, and they were working on the base, and they, aside from Bragg, their kids were going to work on, on the base. That also developed kind of a family culture. On top of that, we not only were scientists and engineers, we had people who could talk credibly. Mm -hmm. Interesting how things happen in your life. I came here because I thought there was babysitting. There wasn't babysitting, but I spent 23 years here. Billy uh, Clickett was here to go to work the first time he opened the doors as the Navy. Mm -hmm. And she was there when they closed the doors on the center. It was, it was just about lunchtime. And I was getting ready to go to lunch, and all of a sudden, Billy comes running around the corner, and I had the office around the corner from the captain. And she says, come on, Bill, quick, we got a problem. I said, well, what's the matter? What's the matter? So by that time, we were in the captain's office, and I said, what's the matter, captain? And he says, Von Beck, you know, not Dr. Von Beck. Von Beck just called, and he's bringing the Russians up here. And I said, what? You know, and he says, what do we do? I says, Again, I said, I'll call the, the, the intelligencer. We'll make this a good public. Uh, oh, I said, that's, and he said, oh, no, no, we can't do that. That's, that's a, we can't do that. He says, and he's, he's, he was literally shaking. Oh, well, here he's, he's a Navy captain, and here come the Russians. We have a Cold War going on with them, tell you. <laughs> they were in town, Philadelphia, for an international space organization conference. Everybody that had anything wanted to have it in Philadelphia, you know. Because it's 1976. So uh, the man down at CNO, he said, do you have a place where you can take them? You know, and she said, well, I think they're here to see the centrifuge. And he said, can you keep them away from anything classified? And that's perfect. So uh, he said, and just make them feel at home and be polite. We don't want any incidents. <laughs> when Von Beck called, I said, are they leaving the city? Or? And he said, they'd be here like 20 minutes or something. Oh, my. Oh. <laughs> so I said, well, geez. I said, get a plaque, Billy. We have to have something to give them, you know? You, you can't come in and shake hands and, you know, anything like that without getting a plaque. And have them send it right up to the office, and the first thing I'll do, I'll take them around, and then I said, Captain, you got to you got to see them. No. <laughs> exactly. So I said, I'm going to, I said, uh, Billy, call security and tell them I need passes, and we have no paperwork on it. You know, they're not signing it. I just want them to have a pass, and we'll take it when they leave. And uh, and then they showed up. So I went to uh, down to the thing, nice big chauffeur uh, limousine, and uh, there were four Russians, and there was Dr. Von Beck. Before we drove over to Central Fuge, we went up to the captain's office, <laughs> and Millie handed me the plaque. And I hand it to the captain now. And it looks like the captain's been waiting for him. He's all smiles and really, you know. That was, uh, we go over to the centrifuge. And it's, uh, the chauffeur was leading the way down to the car and I was going to follow them all. And Millie looked at me and I said, what's the matter, Millie? She said, well, we spelled the word wrong. Development. <laughs> oh, God. We didn't even spell our name right. I said, Billy, get another plaque get it right. and check it. So I said, send it over to the centrifuge. I call the girl over there and, and say, hold it over there till we come over. And uh, don't have it out in the open. So I had taken the plaque when they went in the, the car and uh, we all went over to the centrifuge, and I said, look, this, we're going to be here in a half an hour, an hour. You don't want to carry this heavy plaque around. So I said, I'll, I'll put it in the office here, and on the way out, 
I'll be sure that we get our plaque. You know, I was afraid that uh, if they walked in with that, you know, and show it to somebody, who could he's above us, his players, you know, <laughs> oh, even spell man. him. That's the other, it's the other part of my, why, I like, why everybody liked it so much here. It was, we used to call it the country club because we had sports leagues for just, just about every sport. I, I started the, uh, the golf league for. Mm -hmm. for uh, you still play it. Men, men and, and women. Uh -huh. Mixed to mixed golf league mm -hmm. as opposed to the men's golf league. Spring, spring fling, fling to me was a, like a welfare and recreation party that we, we had occasionally. Okay. But I, I did a run the golf tournament, the Jack and Jill golf tournament. And who was Jill? Were, um, well, I liked, I liked women <laughs> in general. That's not, you're going to cut that out, right? <laughs> People who were pure beginners to come out and try golf. And so I've never been on a golf course, you know. Anybody with men or women. Would say that they said, "Don't worry about it. It's a scramble." Right, right, right. There's four people playing. You all take turns. And mm -hmm. If your ball goes that way, you just go take over the next pick ball, it up pick it up, and go to somebody it. else's. Yeah. So, so we had various. Uh, you, that's the mixed golf league. We had NCMA golf tournaments. We had. I went to Penn State. We did Penn State Jack and Jill tournaments. But that was it. Was mainly for beginners. Get, get over the fear of, and you'd be surprised how many oh, in my force from alone. Uh, um, I don't know, but uh, the, the the women couldn't hit the ball far, but they could putt great. <laughs> you know, and uh, everybody contributed one one shot. But, yeah, in our party, we used to call them W and R parties. Oh. And we had we tried to do like at least two a year. We'd have the spring fling, I thought. And, a Christmas party, mm -hmm. and they were all over the enlisted men's club that they tore down. Oh, okay. The Superman in one show we did. It. Oh, I don't know if I saw a Superman. We did. Uh, we did a uh, jitterbug skit. We did. We did. We uh, we had core that chorus. I did all the all the club. Yeah. Do you have any fun? Rigsby. Mm -hmm. He came in for his tenor tenure here. Um, we did the Christmas, they used to have Christmas Follies in that, you'll see that too, or the Follies. And he came in, he brought it to another level. We had stages set up. And oh, maybe that's her. It predated Captain Rigsby. I think he was here, his first couple of years I was here, so mm -hmm. it was the early 70s. Yeah. Well, that's, I just, uh, yeah, we just We had I, jokes, we had, he was, he was a comedian himself. Oh, that's he, great. He danced, and he, You know, the grapevine and the rumor mill at NADC was bar none, I'm telling you. <laughs> and there was also something called the Food Service Board. And that was the group that was responsible for the cafeteria. We've heard some stories about the cafeteria. I mm -hmm. hope some of them were pleasant. Anyway, they, they, they were. were. Okay, because they what happened, been great. Yeah. what happened was, um, Again, I don't know how it happened. I was on the, I was put on the board. The next thing I know, I was made chairman of the food service board. So uh, we had to go for a contract, renew a contract, and uh, it was the people. I can't remember who had it, but we were. It was time. The contract was up, and we did what I thought was the right thing to do. We had people compete for it, uh, and then um, we selected someone who took over the cafeteria and. This is a story which I'm not exactly sure how true it is, but one Friday, they used to have mac and cheese and stewed tomatoes every Friday. Okay. And one Friday they didn't have it. And so, and this turned out after years, it had become my favorite and expected on Friday. So I showed up with the contractor one day and I said, hey, there was no mac and cheese. And he said, choose what we want. I said, yeah. I said, but I'm on the food service board. I like mac and cheese and stewed tomatoes. And they had, it, they had it on forever and ever after that. The other thing is that Somewhere in the Navy, a um, food service board went broke. Because we were, what we would do is we would collect money and, and have so much in reserve just in case the contractor left, we'd be able to hire it and run, run a food service board. Well, we did all right at that. 
And so the Navy decided what they would do. They came up with this brilliant idea. Since this one group folded, they would bring all the ones that won, all under the Navy supervision, and they would collect our money. And, and then they would decide how much would go back. Um, so I went to the center commander, and you know, what are you going to do? Our says, Navy wants to do this. And I said, tell them we're doing a nice job or something. So I went down to talk to the people, and they had come up with a date that they said, uh, we're going to pull the people in after a certain date, everybody that has more than so much money. We came up with a brilliant idea that from now on we would have special. See, I can't give things away. I grew up too poor. I just don't know how to give things away. However, we reduced our lunches to a very minimal amount. Business boomed because <laughs> every government employee wants a break when you can get it. And, and uh, we paid the difference out of this fund and we got just below the amount of money that, that was allowed. And so we were not, our money wasn't sucked in. When they moved to Pax River, I wrote a check and sent it down for whatever we had left to keep. So I felt kind of, uh, uh, you know, these are things that the center continued with their engineering and their flights and all the wonderful stuff. But in the background, there's always these little support things going on that just keep things going on. Absolutely. Area was the heartbeat, such a unique environment where you had every level of management, all the way from the TD and the CO, all the way down to, to the guys in the machine shop and janitors and, and mailroom people. They had soft pretzels, which Bill McCracken and I always joke about. You could buy soft pretzels uh, at the cafeteria at lunchtime and they baked them. My favorite meal was a soft pretzel and soup. They also had two cart runs, uh, refreshment cart runs, one in the morning around 10 and one in the afternoon around 2. But that wait for that pretzel cart was something special. And that one building had a fantastic cafeteria. I really wanted to get work done. I would go down to the cafeteria, go through the line, and I'd get my table right at the end of all the cash registers, and I'd sit there. And every time I saw somebody, hey, come on over and talk to them. I would do business there. You know, about 20 or 30 people that I needed to talk with, I'd catch them there. And I remember when we you know, were building the new buildings, that was one of the things that I jumped up and down and said, we've got to have a cafeteria there, and they wouldn't let us put a cafeteria in there. Out of curiosity, what was the, um, what did they offer the cafeteria that was just so special? They had, a good, good manager. The food was, was very good. I mean, you had a real big selection. And it was very reason the price was more than reasonable. It was inexpensive. I mean, a, a good pretzel was 10 cents. Someone told us about the pretzels. 10 so cents pretzels. That. That's what we're In saying. fact, they had I'm the, uh, the, questions to you the I know what you're pretzel say. lady had a little car to go around. And me and Franz Bond, uh, we had a back door to our office, and whenever the pretzel lady came, we'd open the back door, we'd run out, we'd always get our pretzels, you know, to get our salt fix. If you were going to say, if I was going to say, what had the biggest credit for winning the Cold War, I would say the cafeteria at War <laughs> I enjoyed the soft pretzels. Oh, okay. I love good soft pretzels. <laughs> I'll go out of my way if I find a good spot, but yeah, I used to make a point to go there when I knew they were there at war, because if you waited too late in the day, they were gone. I loved the cafeteria there. Did you? Oh, that was great. <laughs> they, what was they, so they, great they, about they it? They baked their own pretzels there. <laughs> really? Because it's yeah. Philadelphia, right? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> How were their hoagies? I, uh, <laughs> I don't know if they make hoagies, but they used to have soup. The soup was ready at 10 o'clock, and so were, so were the pretzels. And we would go in there at 10 o'clock. It would be a whole crowd of us would go in there at 10 o'clock and we'd get fresh baked pretzels and soup. Oh, it was great. Someone started uh, a, an idea where, where they would do a Christmas show. This was 1976. It was the centennial or bicentennial year. And uh, for some reason, I used to do little theater and I love theater. I love live theater. And I went to some of the meetings and I began to be active in discussing what we could do and couldn't do. And I ended up getting the job to put this thing together. And it was basically all volunteers from the center and they, they came forward and presented themselves and displayed their talent to the best of their ability and the shows went over fantastically. 
the employees just loved them. And I did, I think there were four all together. And the, the fourth one, we really did it up big. It was a, a pseudo radio broadcast in 1944 mm -hmm. from the Naval Air. What was it called then? The Air Material Unit? Yeah, NAMU. NAMU. And uh, I even tried to get the commanding officer that was there then. And uh, we, we even had a big band, Vincent Lopez Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And uh, we dug, got the money from the employee association. And we had a regular, regular 1940s big band, and they played their stuff. A friend of mine worked at Warminster, and he said, why don't you come here? And I always heard bad things about government jobs and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really find that my perfect job, so I went to Warminster just as an interim measure. Mm -hmm. I ended up, I uh, was there for uh, 34 years, I think. Oh, that's <laughs> inter interim, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because it was just a great job. I mean, you did so many different things and so many exciting things. I, I must say that my, my experiences at NADC are so strong that in my dreams, I am still working at NADC.